The sanctuary of Seri was created and reached its apogee during the Iron Age, that is the period going from the 10th to the 3rd century BC. It has to be remembered that following a conservative tendency that Sardinia shared with other Western European regions, even during the Iron Age, that the neuralgic civilization was still linked to bronze, which was indeed still the dominant metal, as the findings can demonstrate. On the other hand, this was the age in which the island welcomed new cultural influences. From the coasts of the present-day Lebanon, the Phoenicians arrived in Sardinia, who, with the consensus of the Neuragic chieftains, established their trading centers in crucial points of Sardinia's coasts. However, even with these influences, the peculiarities of the Neuragic civilization did not disappear. In fact, also in these centuries, it proved its originality and powerful creativity as the sanctuary that we are going to visit witnesses. The worship area was the centre of the religious life of the Neuragic village of Seri. In this part of the settlement, the priest, or maybe the priestess, celebrated the sacred rites. Here the pilgrims came to worship the gods and to deposit their offerings. Within the boundaries between a robust curtain wall and the parapet, going along the edge of the plateau, there is the well temple, the open air temple, and a series of irregularly scattered buildings. The entrance to the area is possible thanks to two entrances, and one of them is next to a little hut. We go in from this one, following the tracks of those Sardinians of 3,000 years ago. The position of this small hut near the entrance to the temple area suggests that the keeper of the temple lived here and this is why it was called the Gatekeeper's Hut. Leaving the hut, we move along a path, following the fencing wall which leads us to the marvellous Well Temple, the most important monument of the sacred Neuragic architecture. It is in this place that the ceremonies linked to the worship of water took place. The religiosity of the ancient Sardinians was based on the worship of the natural elements, trees, stones and totemic poles. Particularly rooted was the worship of both spring and rainwater the temple is in an elliptical enclosure, a temenos, separating it from the rest of the sanctuary. As the other Sardinian well temples, it is composed of three parts, a hall, a descending stair and an underground well, which together from form a keyhole plan. The hall is square, with a floor of white easily limestone. Thence, there was a 13-step stairway in basalt, lava, leading to the underground chamber used to collect water. The stair was covered by a terraced attic going down parallel to the steps, creating the extraordinary effect of a second stair, but upside down. The almost cylindrical well room has a diameter of 2 metres and its internal walls are formed by 20 lines of basalt ashlars perfectly dressed on the visible side. At the bottom, a wide hollow was dug where water coming from the outside through drainage holes in the walls was collected and left to deposit its impurities. Today, the well has been restored down as far as four meters or so, but the considerable verticality of the walls suggests a further two or more meters in depth. The room was covered by a tolos, namely a false dome obtained by overlaying stone rings whose diameter decreases as the building rises.
Going out from the temple well, we enter the sacred way, the route in which processions took place. It is 50 meters long and 3.4 meters wide. In order to build it, this basaltic part of the plateau was partly levelled and partly paved with basoli, placed on an embankment supported by a terracing wall of basaltic stones to the height of half a metre. This way leads from the well temple to the wide trapezoidal square into which many buildings of different face periods face. The most important among them is the hypothetical temple. At the end of this way there is the meditation hut. The devotees inside this hut would wait for the sacrifices to be carried out. These were also occasions to bring offerings to the nearby open-air temple. Three steps mark the entrance to the hut and lead to a round room of 11.5 metres in diameter. The walls have a bench half a metre high. Inside, a great quantity of neuralgic ex-votos were found, even if in fragments and all scattered. Pottery, large brooches, daggers, and the little sculpture of a priestess wrapped in her mantle are all evidence of the rites carried out here and near the temple we are going to. It is a rectangular building brought to light during the excavations between 1919 and 1921 Caramelli thought it was a hypertrail temple, that is, an open-air temple. The walls, as wide as two metres, in origin were formed of rows of only partly squared basalt blocks, which were subsequently re-lined with more carefully uh, refined limestone ashlars. The cell was equipped with large counters, on which there were hollowed slabs used as conduits to weld the bronze exposures. The fact that this building was a temple is confirmed by the presence of two irregular platforms interpreted as altars. The largest of these suggests that it was used mainly for the sacrifice of bigger animals, such as cattle and deer. The second altar is similar, though not as large, and this was maybe used for smaller animals. The original flooring, made of basalt chips cemented with clay, was found covered by the blackened earth as the result of a fire that ruined this and other buildings of the sanctuary. In this burnt earth a great quantity of ex votos were found, which are important not only because they witness the sacredness of this place, but also they testify that for a very long lapse of time a series of contacts and exchanges with important Etruscan centres took place Next to the minor altar, there is another rectangular room, separated from the cell of the little temple by a square ashlar room. Maybe this was used as a closet for the vote votive objects and perhaps as a sacristy.